not to be like the world and not to be like the great majority of American Christians, but to be like Jesus Christ. I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you. What's wrong with you people? I'm serious. You can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. Hello, humble bees. Welcome to Tulips and Honey. Hi, humble bees. Welcome back to Tulips and Honey. I'm your host, Lauren, and today I'm joined by a very special guest, Brandon Kimber, director of the American Gospel, was kind enough to join me today to discuss his testimony and the documentaries that he has directed. So I hope you'll enjoy this. I hope it'll be a blessing and it'll be edifying to you. Great. Well, hi, Brandon. How are you? I'm good. Nice to meet you, Lauren. Nice to meet you. Thank you for joining me on the program. I'm super excited to talk about this today. I've gotten a lot of questions in from, from my listeners, so I'll try to uh, try to zip through those at the end if that's okay. Sure. We can yeah. kind of, yeah, they're pretty fascinated by you and by your work. So I was, <laughs> I was excited by the questions. If you can't answer some of them, it's okay, because I think some of them might be like, you know, things that maybe we aren't, we're not supposed to know about yet, but we'll, we'll get, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Like so. the 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 other films is that yes maybe? yeah <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit so I I did a, an interview it feels like years ago but like uh, November with Justin Peters and he let it slip he was like well yeah I'm gonna be you know featured a little bit in the third American Gospel yeah. and I was like <laughs> I'm gonna need you to give me some more detail on that and he was like no <laughs> so. <laughs> So I think we're all really, really excited about that. But before we talk about um, your documentaries and everything, I was wondering if you could give us a rundown of your testimony of how you came to faith. Sure. Um, so I uh, I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm uh, the oldest of three boys, and my parents both were saved before um, I, before any of us were born. And um, I grew up in the church. I kind of, I guess, I used to struggle with the idea of sharing my testimony because, you know, because I grew up in the church, I <laughs> didn't really have like, you know, a, a powerful, interesting testimony. And But then I, you know, later on realized that the gospel isn't your testimony, your personal testimony. Right. But, um Related to testimonies, uh, when I grew up, I heard my parents' testimony over and over. So they would remind us of their lives before Christ and, you know, talk about the radical change that happened in, in their hearts. And um, so my mom, I think she lost her mother around age 15. She Her life kind of spiraled into drug addiction, alcoholism, she had a child out of wedlock, was married in an abusive relationship, divorce. This is all before she met my father. And uh, my father was an atheist. He kind of experimented in uh, Eastern religions and uh, told us things like he really felt dead inside before he came to Christ. And so they, as parents, emphasized the need for us children to be born again, but I didn't really understand how to know if I had been born again. Um, okay. And, you know, we were never taught any of uh, those details. And so we were in a, a charismatic church um, from, you know, from birth till about age 15. And um, that church had split um because of something called the Toronto Blessing, which right. is kind of like the place where Bill Johnson started Bethel. All these major charismatic leaders today will say they caught the fire of the Holy Spirit at right. Toronto. Um, and so our church split because of that movement. And my parents took us um, to a new church that was pro Toronto. So everything that was going on there was like the stuff that you see. If you like Google what happened at the Toronto blessing, everything from the slain in the spirit to, you know, the, the really, uh, the manifestations of the spirit that, um, I would say aren't manifestations of the spirit because 
the fruit of the spirit is self-control and everything you saw in that was the lack of self-control and chaos. Um, <laughs> I didn't really understand that, that at the time. I always thought it was kind of weird what was going on, but kind of accepted it because I was young. Yeah. And um, I would say that during that time, the gospel was very unclear or assumed. And the focus was heavily on grace. Um, there was this idea that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament were different, where our pastor would say, like, I'm a New Testament preacher, not an Old Testament preacher. And um, the focus was more on the Holy Spirit, the gifts, um, you know, kind of like getting your next spiritual fix. Right. Um, doctrine was considered like dead religion. At the same time, uh, when I was young, my parents took us to see this play called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames, which, you know, it's performed in a church with actors and basically has these stories, these small little stories of different people who they show how they die and then they stand before God and their name is either in the book of life or not. And they're going to heaven or they're going to hell. And so this was terrifying for me <laughs> as a kid. Um, it really made me scared of hell. Um, and I remember coming home that night asking my um, parents this question. And this question was based on the end of this play. They had an altar call and they asked people if they wanted to say the sinner's prayer. And so my question to my mom was, how come you never told me you had to ask Jesus into your heart to go to heaven? And so I prayed that prayer um, as a kid and probably hundreds of times after that um, as a child and was confused about where my assurance rested. Um, first of all, I wasn't, I probably wasn't coming to Christ for the right reasons. I, right. It, I was just terrified of hell and mm -hmm. I didn't have any idea of how God and his justice and righteousness related to my sin right. and that the problem was really between me and God. And I was thinking it was like, well, I'm just scared of, you know, Satan and the devil, you know, and hell. Yeah. You know? So, um, you know, I thought every time I sinned, I lost my salvation. I need to say this prayer again. At the same time, I, th I really think I, um, there was a lot of pride in my heart and self-righteousness because I was comparing my life to the lives of my parents and also to my brothers because my my personality as a kid was I'm I was kind of the more obedient child um and so I would often hear my parents say things like to my brothers why can't you be more like Brandon and so that kind of right. like fueled this pride and self-righteousness um in my heart which was already there but um, I would, you know, I'm comparing my life to the lives of my parents, to my brothers, instead of a holy God. So there was a time in college where the gospel became much more clear. And, uh, you know, I, I went to a secular college and our first class was critical thinking. And they immediately challenged everyone to put all your beliefs, um, you know, question all your beliefs. And wow. I, I think that my faith was pretty solid because I, I was convinced that it was true. And But I think I had a lack of knowledge mm -hmm. and understanding, you know, the reasons why I believed what I believed. So that kind of led me down this, this path of wanting to know that, know the reasons why I believed what I believed. Um, so like most people, this is a very common story. I came across some sermons on the internet, <laughs> the first being from Paul Washer. Yes. Um, oh, that's a good one. so, you know, immediately with his sermons, I'm introduced to this idea of easy believism, which I immediately recognize that that's what I grew up in. Right. And he, you know, attacks things like the sinner's prayer. But at, at the same time, he presented the gospel in a way that I had never 
heard before where it's focused on the attributes of God and how, you know, you need this balanced view of God, you know, the God I kind of grew up with. Well, while I did hear about hell and had a fear of hell, um, God was all grace and all love and, and no, there wasn't really much talk about his holiness, righteousness, justice. Um, you know, other, um, other ministers I came across, I started to learn how, you know, the law of God was used to expose our sin. The, the distinction between the law and the gospel was something that really helped me understand um, the Bible in a better way and like in seeing Christ and all the scripture. So just over time, I, the Lord just opened my, my mind, my eyes, my heart to understanding the true gospel. So I can never, when I, when I share my testimony, I can't like pinpoint a time where I can say I was saved at this point. It just seems like this (laughs) blur or long process. Um, Right. So, yeah, I think, I think that that summarizes it. Yeah. That's why I love to ask this question. And actually why, why I usually start with this is because I've, I've heard from a lot of listeners whenever they hear my testimony, because everything that you just described was like, it's almost exactly my story. Like the, the same things, the same feelings. I was in the word of faith. I was dealing with the same sort of manifestations that never really felt right. And I never was able to actually get involved in them, but you know, that was the only Christianity I knew. I repeated the sinner's prayer over and over again. And a street preacher sent me a Paul Washer sermon <laughs> in, uh, back in 2015. But the, um, the only difference is that whenever I heard that, that Paul Washer sermon, it was an immediate thing where I can point to the time and place. And a lot of, a lot of my listeners will say, I don't have that. Am I, am I even saved? I don't know that exact day. And I'm like, oh, absolutely not. That's like that, that's not, that's not how this works. God, chooses sovereignly how to um, yeah. bring his sheep in. And if he chooses to sovereignly bring you in, in a, in a different way than he's done for me, that doesn't make the, um, the drug addict that gets pulled, you know, directly into the yeah. kingdom. You know, all of our testimonies are miracles where God has raised up a dead person. So that's why I love to ask this question so that my listeners that feel that discomfort can hear that they're not like alone. The majority of people actually have this. Even Justin Peters said that it was a a period of months where he felt a difference, but he couldn't pinpoint a day. So I think it's encouraging for um, people to hear that, that there's different ways that God works. He's doing the same thing in all of our hearts, but he's going to do it in different ways. And so Mm -hmm. it's really cool though, that it was a Paul Washer sermon too. I I really, I was excited to hear that in some of your other interviews. I was like, Oh no way. How is this possible? But very, very cool. And thank you for sharing that. Did you, you, when you were in college, were you going to college for film film work or was this something that happened later on? Yes. um, I, I majored in film production Film, like video and film was always a hobby. I think I picked up a camera around eighth grade and um, started making like home movies with my brothers. And I started doing videos for like class projects. And then I worked at a pool for a number of years and started doing documentaries about the staff. Wow. <laughs> kind of like... That is so neat. Comedy type stuff, you know. Um, so that, it was kind of like a skill that I was self-taught. Um, you know, I'd watch movies and just kind of figure out, well, this is how you do this. I want to make it look like a real movie. So, um, but college helped, you know, with the knowledge aspect, the terminology behind filmmaking and stuff. It wasn't the greatest for hands-on experience, but I had, you know, been doing that on my own. So. Wow. That is so cool. At what point did you decide? Well, okay, let me back up because I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm really excited. I I love the tech technological side of things, like how, how things work and stuff with these things. But before I get too far ahead of myself, what was your, what was your parents' response to these things? Did your, did your family, um, respond to your salvation and your desire to be um, doing these documentaries in a positive way and 
And is there any like fruit that you've seen in your family since all of this has happened? Yeah. So kind of backing up again, one, one of the reasons for wanting to make this was because I think my parents, um, although we had left that charismatic world, were still still kind of had one foot in that theology. Um, you know, I I could go to their house today and still find a lot of their old books, and it's kind of been eye opening to like what they were being fed. Um, they have Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland, E. W. Kenyon books. Um, so they were definitely influenced by the word of faith movement. And from my own memories, I can remember watching Benny Hinn crusades and hearing about these different televangelists that I now know are part of the word of faith movement. But so I, as I was learning about what I grew up in, I wanted to make the film kind of as a tool to help my parents see the same thing. And I think the fruit has been good. They have responded positively to the films. Um, They agree that there's a lot of, you know, a lot of these people are false teachers and they didn't really realize that before. Um, I'm not sure that we're in complete 100% agreement still, but I I do see it as a positive uh, thing. They, They definitely have shared the movie with their friends from our church and stuff like that. So, yeah. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's, I'm so glad to hear that. I I mean, it's always, I know that it's God's providence and and everything, but it's always a little bit sad for me to hear from um, people I'm interviewing that their families respond maybe negatively or anything. Cause I I know that um, there's not very many people in my family that want to talk to me about religion at all. So I know how discouraging it can be. So I'm really excited to hear that, that they're, that they're behaving positively and how cool that you approached this project like that with that, that heart of your, um, you're wanting to see your parents understand the truth. Did you expect it to blow up like this? Because that, that's like sort of a small, <laughs> a small goal yeah. there for this. This is, this is global now, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did not expect it to be as big as it did at all. Um, (laughs) You know, right at this point, I think it, we have it, at least the first film in about 15 languages. Wow. You know, different people reaching out around the world saying, this is not just a problem in America. This is, this is a problem here and we want to do subtitles. (laughs) Um, So a lot of people just volunteer to translate the film because they have, you know, a desire to see, you know, people in their language understand this too. Wow. And they're responding well, because I mean, it's got the flag on it. It's pretty American. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Some people are confused about, you know, if they don't know the context, they're like, they think American gospel means it's a good thing. No. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's a critique of the American gospel. If yeah. if the audience is not aware of that yet. <laughs> Hopefully they are. We've all, you know, we've talked about this so many times on the program, but if anybody's listening that's a new listener and they haven't gotten this. This this has been and I and I've talked to several other people that use this as well. It's like a a gospel tract video. So I, instead of like a piece of paper or even a packet, I've got a what time is purple around here somewhere. Um, a packet, those are great options, but you're not necessarily, especially right now, when we can't actually um, go out and hand out gospel tracts, um, which is something that, you know, I've got a wallet full of gospel tracts. And every time I go to the grocery store, I'm like, I can't, my, my husband works in the hospital. I can't like justify possibly handing anybody the COVID virus. So, but you know, it's, yeah. it's something that we can do. We can send this, these, these documentaries that you make, we can send links to them. We can uh, purchase them for people who want to watch this. So it's, it's fascinating to me what you've got here. It's not just a gospel message, but it's a gospel message explaining where it's gotten wrong. I mean, there's Catholicism rebuked in the first one, as well as the, um, 
the prosperity gospel. So you handle all these well. Everybody was, you know, the main thing that I hear is he he fixes the Todd White conundrum, you know, like you even rewind it slowly. My daughter, she's nine and she was like super excited when she saw that. She came running, mommy, look, he's got it. He's rewinding it slowly. We go, no, I've watched it. It's so fun. But so you did a great job with these, but you you've got um Christ alone. And then the second one, Christ crucified. So I, we see why you made the first one. Um, and and I'd like to hear a little bit more about why you made the second one and, and whatever you want to divulge into the third one. But how did you go about, just getting back to like the, the nitty gritty technical stuff, how did you go about hunting these guys down that you have in the first one? Because some of these guys are not easy to get a hold of. And you've gotten a hold of some of some of our favorite reform dudes. Yeah, it's it was difficult. Um, the process started with me making a concept trailer um, using some footage of uh, my friends and my brother um, along with like clips from the internet just to kind of, you know, show the direction of the film. And I sent this out with, you know, uh, a PDF about me, about the project, kind of like a treatment of the documentary, what it's all about. Um, I emailed that to people that I was interested in interviewing and, um, you know, people were, as people, as some people were, um, cooperative, you know, it was kind of like word of mouth. Like if this person's friends with another pastor, can you give me a, you know, (laughs) a good recommendation of, you know, your experience in our interview? Um, for people that weren't, uh, I guess, trusting of me, which is completely understandable, I'm, who am I? And I'm just wanting to make a film about the gospel. And it's a pretty big deal because um, you don't want to put your words about this very important topic in the hands of anyone that you don't right. really know, you know, their background. So for people... Um, Paul Washer, for example, uh, declined at first because he had some experience being in a film that he later regretted being a part of. And so I ended up like going to his church because my in-laws lived nearby (laughs) Um, in Virginia. I'm in Ohio, so we're eight hours away. Um, And I had a conversation with them and through that and like allowing them to uh, withhold signing their appearance release until after they saw the finished film, that kind of helped get people who were um, unsure about whether they should participate. That's smart. Wow. So yeah, that was kind of, it's, it's kind of risky. (laughs) Yeah. Because if you make someone, you know, a big part of the film and they see it and then decide they don't want to be in it at the at the end of the process, then it's like, oh, what am I going to do? Oh, so. then you gotta just start, oh, wow, that is really, really risky. But at least yeah. they, so was there anybody that did back out or was everybody like, this is fantastic? Because I mean, I already know it's fantastic. So. No, no one, no one did. And, and the process, even in the second film where I interviewed people who I disagreed with they're in the progressive Christian camp they even signed off without any changes they wow so yeah I didn't have any problems that's (laughs) surprising yeah that's that's very surprising yeah praise God and that means they had to watch it right so they they were able to see I'm going to be praying about that because I love I love well okay I love both of them I, I can't, it's like picking a favorite child. You can't do that. But I mean, the, the, uh, what you're addressing in the second one is just another one of those topics. We do have an issue in um, Christianity right now with just illiteracy where we, we, we can read scripture, but for some reason, there's so many people that don't understand. And so you're addressing these things that ought to be basics, really. I mean, I've read the um, institutes, Calvin's institutes a couple of times. They called that a primer back then. And I mean, yeah. that was their beginning 
part where then from there they moved on to more difficult. And I'm like, how we, we, whoa, we're way behind the curve on this one. We, yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of uh, issues with this. So these are really great options for people who are wanting to um, teach and, and really help other people understand the basics of Christianity. But what drove you for the second one? What was, what was it that, that made you want to go forth in and go ahead with the second one? There were, there were still some influences in the churches that I had attended that kind of opened my eyes to the world of progressive Christianity. Um, one, I think after the charismatic church, we were in a Nazarene church for about a decade or more. And I had friends who went off to college at Nazarene universities and came back with this, with very uh, progressive views about Christianity. And when I say that, I, I, I mean like there's, a low view of scripture where they're not viewing it as the word of God, but as it's just written by men. And this is man's evolving understanding of God over time. So they're going to look at the old Testament under that or through that lens and say, you know, when they encounter stuff that's difficult about God's wrath, his justice, um, they're going to say, well, this is how Israel understood God at the time it wasn't a correct view of God. Now we know better. We have a higher and wiser view of God. And so you can't, you can't really um, have a lot of conversations with people. If the foundation of scripture is completely different, if you don't agree that this is the word of God. Um, So I had friends who were making comments on Facebook about, you know, I don't believe Jesus died for our sins as in he was punished for our sins, but he was, but they're basically saying it just means that he died because of our sin. Like we were sinful and killing him. So it didn't really do anything objective related to God's justice or propitiating his wrath against sin. They're just viewing it as, um, Christ is a moral example of of how to be loving. So he was forgiving people as they were murdering him. So we should be just as loving as him. That's it. That's how they view the cross. (laughs) And I think that just turns the faith into being like every other religion in the world. Like anyone could be a moral example, right? Right. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. That's, uh, that's something I used to say. I remember asking my husband when we were just dating, uh, why did Jesus need to die? Why not Why not just somebody less important? Um, John John the Baptist, he was moral. Why not just, you know, let him die instead of Jesus? I, I had such a small, like, well, a non-existent understanding of penal substitution that I didn't even understand why it needed to be Jesus or that Jesus was God made man. Like, and, and if you don't have that basis, then how can you even understand the gospel? So it's really, it's a lot more serious than I think um, just your average lay person would, would expect it to be whenever you start getting into the nitty gritty. Yeah, totally agree. And I have, I had also seen um, also posts on Facebook from people from my old church who were uh, quoting a Franciscan friar named Richard Rohr. (laughs) <laughs> um, who I kind of cover in Christ Crucified. Um, Richard Rohr is, uh, I would say, the kind of like Rob Bell's inspiration <laughs> for how he departed right. in his theology. And I, I don't even know if I could say he departed. Like, as far as I remember, as far as um, when he was doing NUMA videos before his Love Wins book came out, I would say he was influenced by Richard Rohr. Um, And this guy is huge across progressive Christianity. Um, And so I started looking into his teaching. And uh, (laughs) one of the main things is he uh, has a different view of Jesus and Christ. He kind of splits Jesus and Christ. So He calls it the universal or cosmic Christ. And his belief is that the first incarnation of Christ was in the Big Bang. 
uh, <laughs> in creation. And um, his view is that everything that we see is Christ. Uh, it's called panentheism. Yeah. Um, it's not pantheism. Pantheism would be that all is God. Right. So you can say everything is that we see is is God. And but panentheism is um all in God. So it's like it, it's a little confusing. It's <laughs> God is in creation, but he also transcends creation. But Rohr basically believes that um since everyone and everything is Christ and in Christ, that we don't need an atonement. We're already reconciled to God. Right. And so he's a universalist. He doesn't believe in hell. He doesn't believe um, that there needs to be an atonement. Everyone's already in Christ. It's this very uh, new age mixture yeah. with Christianity. and. Um, his influence is just huge. He even goes to the Nazarene church, which I was a part of. Um, they hosted him as he was a guest speaker at, at their like 2017 uh, young clergy conference. And so I was like shocked like yeah. uh, when, after leaving that church that, Oh wow, this kind of explains <laughs> where some of this progressive stuff was coming from. Unfortunately. Yeah. Is it leaking in? Do you see it? Like, is is this something that you're seeing, like, leaking into solid churches in in a way where it's sort of just deceptive? Because a, a lot of people will say, you know, God is love, and of course He loves everybody, and and almost for um, non-believers, if they're sitting in the pews, it it, it feels more. Uh, not appropriate, but it just, it makes him feel better about talking about God. If he's this God of love and he's in everything and everybody's already, you know, saved. Is that how it slips in to these churches? And are you seeing that um, in, in good solid churches or is this just something that we're seeing in the fringes? I think it's definitely creeping into more solid churches and largely that's due to the, to the internet. Um, Another aspect of this is, I don't know if you've heard of the Enneagram. Yep. Um, Richard Rohr is actually the person that introduced the Enneagram to the church, through the Catholic wow. Church. And this, this is uh, in a lot of different seeker-sensitive churches. Like you'll see Stephen Furtick and Andy Stanley talking about the Enneagram it's spreading everywhere and they don't um, understand. I mean that this, this is a new age personality tool that came from automatic writing. So there's one of the creators admits that, um, that he got this from automatic writing, which is like opening your mind and you're getting this from a demonic source yeah. from a spirit that's not of God. And uh, so that's, you know, that's one way. Um, there's a video um, I filmed with Marsha Montenegro, who's in Christ Crucified, who she also has a book on the origins of the um, Enneagram. I think her book's called Richard Rohr and the Enneagram Secret. Mm -hmm. And so she kind of talks about his influence and also through through that personality tool but um yeah i mean aside from that i personally saw you know that that uh the progressive christian um influence in the uh nazarene church that i was in the youth group was watching numa videos from rob bell wow um i had a Sunday school teacher quoting, trying to secretly quote Rob Bell um, in a blog, and I I kind of <laughs> called it out because I I recognized the language, but like there was no oversight over what was being taught. Wow! In like your Sunday school class or oh, your youth. Oh, so dangerous. So yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I this is this is one of the things that's great about your documentaries. 
you, you're not just giving the issues and then giving the um, the biblical concepts that help us understand why these are wrong, but you go back to the history of that. And you did that in the first one with, with the um, history of like these false teachers and you're doing, you did that again in Christ crucified where you're, you're dealing like you just, like you just talked about all these different things. And I love that Marsha's in it and she's explaining these things because it is dangerous. We all love for some weird reason, we love to do personality tests. I don't really know why that is about human beings, but you know, I'm always hearing about type A stuff, type O, oh, type A personality. Yeah. You know, I don't really know why we, we like love that to so hear much. about ourselves. Yes, that's got to be what it is. We just we love that. But what um, are you taking in? And you don't have to give me any details. That that um, I mean, you can if you want to. I mean, I'm probably not going to stop you. But the third, the third um, Christ, uh, the third American Gospel coming up is that is that something that you brought into that too, where you dug into the history because that's that really appeals to me. I love to see not just one aspect, but I like to see the full picture of what we've got going on. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely plan to examine some history. Um, so the topic of the third, uh, I won't give the title away yet. Um, I think it's a final title, but <laughs> the topic is um, on the Holy Spirit and comparing the biblical view of the Holy Spirit to what we see in the NAR and the New, oh, New Apostolic Reformation. So that's a, ma- a, a massive topic. Wow. There's definitely a lot of history, you know, with revival, yeah. different you know, a lot of these people in these movements have um, historical figures that they look back on as their generals um, mm-hmm. in the faith. Like this guy was a anointed um, faith healer, and we're trying to kind of follow in his <laughs> footsteps and get his mantle. Yeah, soak you know. it in. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, there's definitely... I think the history part is important in that topic too. Oh, wow. That's really exciting. Oh my goodness. I'm way too excited now. Is, is So you can't give away the title, but does it flow with the others? Because I'm trying to think of how you could do Christ something whenever it's with the Holy Spirit. Did you have to sort of venture uh, out? <laughs> it's a little different. Um, I don't think I can, in, it's not going to have Christ in the title, but um, it's definitely a title that you find in scripture. <laughs> Oh my goodness. This is so exciting. How long do we have to, well, wait, okay. I better not ask that. That was one of my listeners questions. I'll ask that later. Sorry. I'm getting too excited. Okay. So what is, what is your hope for this, for the third one? Cause we've seen the first one and the second one absolutely just do a tremendous, I mean, I, I guess viral, that's the right word for it. I don't know, but I, I don't, I don't like the word viral for things like this just because uh, it's not just people watching it. People are hearing the truth and they're either being saved out of these false churches or they're in these false churches and they just needed that understanding. Like maybe um, I know a lot of people tell me I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on it. And these videos are doing that. So what, what is your hope for the third one? Well, um, you know, the, the hope is the same that it'll have the same eye opening impact that at least the first one has um it it is kind of continuing or expanding upon the same topic as the first film although the the new apostolic reformation and when i say that i'm just talking about people who believe in the modern day offices of apostle and prophet um there are a lot of people that say that the nar doesn't exist it's not a thing (laughs) <laughs> but they definitely acknowledge that there are people who believe in modern <laughs> office of apostle and prophet. Um, so I see it as walking through a journey with multiple people who were in that deception. You know, you're kind of like the first you're showing how, the Lord opened their eyes to some of these problems. You're also giving, you know, not only a negative critique of the errors, but contrasting that with the positive, what does scripture teach is the truth about the gospel. And so there are some themes that will be brought up again that we're 
briefly touched upon in the first, you know, the biggest, the biggest thing is the, uh, kenosis, I would call it heresy. Yeah. Um, they, and the reason why I want to expand upon it is because, uh, you know, a lot of the pushback that I see from the first film is hitting on that. And so the claim is that men like Bill Johnson, Todd White, even Todd White's mentor, whose name is uh, Dan Moeller, they preach a Jesus who in the incarnation emptied himself of all divinity. And so he didn't do any of his works. He didn't do his miracles, didn't live his sinless life as God. They say he only did it as a man in right relationship with God. And they are very aware of the critique that we are sharing. You will hear them respond to it. They'll say, well, you know, people, people accuse me of um, <laughs> denying the deity of Christ. And that's not exactly what we're saying. You like, right. it's very important to be precise in the language you're using. Like, you can't just say Bill Johnson denies the deity of Christ because I wouldn't say he does. Um, he acknowledges that Christ was, you know, eternally God prior to the incarnation. But in the incarnation, he teaches that Christ emptied himself of all divinity to the point where he had no supernatural abilities whatsoever. Like right. he couldn't do miracles. He couldn't live the sinless life without the Holy spirit. Um, and he'll say things like, well, I believe Jesus was eternally God or he was, he'll, he might even say he was fully God and fully man. But when he says he was fully God and fully man, and you follow that up with, but he emptied himself of all divinity that's contradictory. Mm -hmm. So the key is if you're saying that Jesus didn't do his work as God, you're basically saying that our salvation wasn't accomplished by God. It right. was accomplished by a man. Exactly. Um, and we can do the same exact thing, things that Jesus can do. And that, that Jesus can't save you. Exactly. Um, Jesus had to be fully and truly God and fully and truly man. And if you're denying the deity part of that, you don't have Christ's ability to absorb the wrath, the infinite wrath of God. You don't have his infinite value. Like how does, how does one man, you know, how does, how does his suffering for a few hours, um, pay for this? the infinite sins of a multitude right. of men. It's only yeah. because he's the infinite God who has infinite value. And if he's just a man, he, he can't be that mediator between God and man. He is both the God. He's the God man. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you tweak any of that stuff, that's why this is so important. If you're tweaking any of this stuff, you're losing the gospel. And so you can't, you can't just get away. And I've seen them. It, this We addressed this, um, I don't know, it's probably been six months ago. I can't even remember now. We got so much pushback over this little issue of, I mean, us one one little meme was all it was. We were addressing this issue. And there was so much pushback of people saying, Bill Johnson doesn't teach that. He doesn't say, but it, it is actually in his book. And there are he is actually teaching these things, as is Todd White. That's how they get away with saying that we can be like that. We can be, yeah, I, we can do all those things. It's their Jesus is really merely a, an example. Um, they're very offended if you if you say if you're suggesting that Jesus came to accomplish the impossible, um, something that we can't do. Right. The 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 important thing to understand is the Trinity. Again, it always comes back to the Trinity. <laughs> um, it's a difficult topic, um, but it's so key because, yes, Jesus did his works by and through the Holy Spirit. 
um, it's true to say that, that that's what scripture says, but it's wrong to say that his own deity was not involved. Christ, here's how the triune God works from all eternity. Christ, who is God, the son has always done his works by the father or from the father by the spirit. So they always do their works together. So when you see Jesus in the incarnation performing miracles through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. This is the Father, Son, and Spirit working together like they always do to do their works. And so to say that, to suggest that Christ's relationship with with the Spirit was um just like our relationship to the spirit and that we could do the same things that's completely wrong there's a a big difference between how like the apostles did performed miracles um and how Jesus performed miracles the the key question is how did people respond so when Christ walked on water the disciples worshiped him yep. because they realized that the God, the creator of the universe was in the same boat with them. Right. Yep. When the disciple, the like apostles did their miracles in acts. I think I can't remember the chapter. There was a group of people that started praising them as if they were gods and they like tore their clothes and like right. freaked out. Like this isn't us. <laughs> this is, <laughs> You know, they didn't nope. allow worship to go to them. So the, there's the difference. Mm-hmm. When Christ did his miracles, he is God the Son, the second member of the Trinity, taking on the addition of human flesh. So his deity is veiled. It's not a, mm-hmm. his deity isn't being subtracted. He's adding humanity and his deity is veiled. Mm-hmm. See the unveiling of his deity in the transfiguration. And so, you can't say that Jesus didn't do something as God because he, his person is, <laughs> is God, the son. Like right. <laughs> if you're saying that you're denying that, right? Right. So yeah. It's, yeah. It, it, it's it a, makes it's perfect a, sense when you say it like that though. Like it's a, it's a hard thing to explain. And that's why I think it needs to be explained in more mm-hmm. detail, you know, in a film because when you just throw out there, oh, Bill Johnson denies the deity of Christ or Todd White denies the deity of Christ, right. that doesn't do, you know, people are going to object and you have to be mm-hmm. fair with what they actually teach, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, they're just not, they're not going to listen to you. It really is discrediting if you can't um, be very specific with what you're talking about. I think this is so fascinating to me because we've we've had this this um this problem since the very beginning right like the gnostics and irenaeus the church has always had this battle <laughs> against trying to explain and understand the deity of christ and the the relationship of the trinity so this is this is going to be a really helpful uh a really helpful documentary i'm super excited when um when you are looking at the state of christianity and you're deciding about these movies and what you're going to see do you, is there a a main threat that you see that's the most dangerous thing that we're facing right now in the church is there is there something that like you see and you're like okay next time this is what i'm going to be making a movie about or are you covering that in this one um i mean all the errors are kind of different flavors of the same problems um there's always a problem with the law and the gospel being confused like in the nar you're taught that you are basically like another jesus a little jesus a little christ and that your testimony is the gospel you can live the gospel and you can do the gospel by bringing the kingdom through miracles and signs and wonders and the the definition of the gospel never includes you or what you do. It's always about Christ and what he has done. So again, there's the confusion there. There, I see it, you know, you can see it 
everywhere. It's in progressive Christianity. Um, you know, because they're denying basically the core thing of what Christ has done in his substitutionary death, their gospel just becomes love God, love people. Right. It's just be like Jesus, be loving like Jesus, right? Yeah. But love God, love people is the summary of the law. Right. The Pharisees ask, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, which is the summary of the first, you know, commands one through four in the Ten Commandments. And then love neighbor is five through ten. Right. This is the law. (laughs) And, And they often will speak against uh, like legalism or, mm-hmm. um, you know, a works base. They're all about grace, you know, but by just saying that love God, love people is the gospel. You're embracing like a softer, kinder form of legalism. Yeah. Um, if, if the law of God is held up to you, and you somehow think you have been keeping that law, <laughs> you are st- <laughs> You are deceived. Um, yep. you, there's self-righteousness there. The law is a mirror that should show you that you've sinned and that you failed to keep the law. And then you need the hope of the gospel. God have mercy on me, a sinner. You know, yeah. um, Christ himself is the gospel. In his person and work, he offers the forgiveness of sins because, you know, he's gracious and just through faith in what he has done, um, we can find salvation. So if you are, again, it's a law and gospel issue. Um, I'm sure there are other future topics that (laughs) uh, I don't want to talk about them, but (laughs) I can, I see the same problem there. It's usually always related to that somehow, or it's like, a problem of deifying man and demoting right. Christ. Yep. Um, you know, That's in progressive it. Christianity, Richard Rohr thinks everyone has the divine DNA. We're all, we are all Christ. That's no different than Kenneth Copeland saying mm-hmm. that we're little gods and that yes. you know, yep. Jesus mm-hmm. was no different than Adam in the Garden of Eden. Like, oh. it's the same satanic lie that you see in genesis that you will be like god it's just like wrapped in a different package yeah it's so clear too whenever you compare it to that that's amazing to me that they don't see it but i guess i mean they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness so it shouldn't be a surprise but it really is when you put it like that the same issues but just a different flavor they're using different words and everything but it it's um it's almost um uh, it's weird to me whenever I see those groups so fighting amongst themselves, like fighting with each other. And I'm like, oh, but you guys are saying the same thing. Just yeah. a little differently. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's kind of interesting to see that. But um, so let's take this away um, a little bit from the uh, theological stuff, because I have some technical questions about movie making. You're um, right now, obviously, we're all stuck at home. Has that like put a damper on anything? Is that going to push the third one out? Or are you able to just keep on plugging away with edits and stuff at home? Uh, it, it has definitely made it uh, difficult to film people. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. And I've been trying to find ways around that, whether it's hiring someone who's closer to the person so that, you know, I don't have to travel. (laughs) Um, I'm hoping that I have a window of travel in the summer, but I don't know. It's, it doesn't look good, (laughs) (laughs) but, um, you know, there are options like zoom or having people film themselves, but then I, you know, I I don't want to do that because I like good production values (laughs) i want it to look good right um so yeah that's something that has been a difficulty um i was going to do like a trip a big trip right before the whole coronavirus shutdown happened and that that canceled so it's kind of like trying to re uh figure all that out and 
um, yeah, that's something that I could use prayer about. Um, yeah, absolutely. It, you know, the plan was to have this released in 2021. It could still happen, but it could get delayed. I don't know. Sure. No, we'll be praying for you for that. I'm sure that it takes a lot longer after you get the recording. That's probably like the beginning part of it, huh? Yeah, and I have some stuff shot so I can work with what I have. And it gives me more time to research, I guess. Oh. So, and find new people. Um, so there's some good things to that. <laughs> <laughs> begrudgingly admitting a little bit of a good thing there yeah, yeah i get it so when you're um when you're doing these interviews and you're you're going to uh, visit all these people has there been one particular person that has made you like the most nervous to talk to huh i don't know if i don't know if i can think of anyone i mean the the interviews with uh, Bart Campolo and Tony Jones were a little nerve wracking at first because we don't agree. Right. And I didn't know how that was going to go. But I, you know, they were both very friendly. And, um, you know, with Tony, I went out to dinner with him the night before and we talked and Bart is very kind, but there were moments in the interviews that were very intense, <laughs> you know, where you could say some, I wasn't raising my voice, but you could tell from their interview that they were getting a little aggravated maybe. Um, oh, okay. But yeah, I would say those guys, uh, when you're interviewing people you don't agree with. Yeah. It's yeah, I haven't a, had to do that yet. <laughs> I thought about it. I thought about it a couple of times, bringing some folks on that um, maybe we could like have a little bit of a conversation. And I was like, I don't, I don't think I can handle that kind of stress. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> it would just make me so nervous. But that's really fascinating. Um, we, we'll be praying for you um, uh, with that in your in your next upcoming um, American Gospel. Have you had to do that again, or are you planning on it? I'm thinking about it. Um... You know, there's there's a fine line. I guess, you know, what what everyone likes to bring up, especially with the first film and the topic of the third film, is the uh, debate over the gifts of the Spirit, cessationism versus continuationism. Um, with the topic of the NAR and their theology, there are people on both sides of that divide that agree that there is a problem with that theology. Right. And so I think it would be helpful to find people who are in the continuationist camp that, and I have found a few who, d who are willing to speak out mm -hmm. against that to show that this is not an issue about, you know, it's, you don't have to be a cessationist to believe that this is wrong, you know, because that, that's, that's what they'll say. That's what everyone says that this is Calvinist cessationist propaganda, you know, <laughs> and that's not the, those aren't the issues at all. And that's just kind of like a straw man that they throw out Yeah, because they right. just don't want to actually interact with the arguments, you know? Yeah, that would make sense if you bring in some of the people from the other side and they that's actually one of the questions that one of the listeners sent in for you. So we'll we'll get to that. <laughs> you're so lucky. You got some really fun uh, some fun questions here. <laughs> um the last technical question that I wanted to ask you though before we got into listener questions is um do you do you have to go when you're doing these videos and I'm sorry, I know this is super random, but I really like the behind the scene kind of thing. When you're going, are you going with like a full team? Like do you have to have a set crew of everybody that's doing different things or do you go with just like a couple of guys and you're, you're just doing your thing? How does that work whenever you're like really recording these, these big name people? A large majority of the interviews I did by myself. Wow. <laughs> um, really? So we're, we, our company is pretty small. We don't have the biggest budget. So when it, when I if I am if I'm shooting an interview in my area, I'll definitely use 
some of my coworkers to help. So we have like a multi-person crew. <laughs> but when I do these trips where I, you know I'm flying out to California or wherever, um, it's usually just me, and I've been able to figure out how to just set up two or three cameras, monitor them and be the person asking the questions at the same wow. time. <laughs> so That's it's, intense. It's pretty, it's pretty difficult, but I've, I'm kind of used to it. Um, <laughs> it's not ideal at all, right. but <laughs> <laughs> if you have a wow. low budget, it's possible. <laughs> That's really impressive because you look at these, these videos and it doesn't seem like this is a low budget, anything. So in that line of reasoning, what would your encouragement be then for anybody that would like to make videos that they want to be able to glorify God through their talents with this? What kind of encouragement would you have for uh, young directors or people who hope to be that someday? Well, I mean, it's, it's definitely doable. Um, <laughs> it's possible to make, you know, I, I guess there's different aspects of it. Uh, I want the quality to be good. Um, as far as like the lighting and the sound. And I think that's really important because when someone turns on video, you know, watches a YouTube video, those are the first things people notice and right. really decides whether or not they want to continue watching um, is that quality. Um, making a whole documentary, though, is very uh, difficult when you're you – know, I guess there's different types. You know, you might find a story about a single person and that might involve a few other people in that story, but it's it's a little easier to put together something like that where it's focused on one person's story. Sure. When you're taking multiple people and multiple stories and trying to weave those into like some theological narrative that gets a lot more complicated and takes a lot <clears throat> more patience and prayer. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't do well with handling multiple tasks. Um, I think I have like a typical male brain where <laughs> I can only do one thing well at a time. Right. Um, so in a film like this, you might have – the process is basically this. You interview 20 or 50 people. All those interviews get transcribed into text. Then you have to separate all of those into different topics. And I'm organizing – you know, everyone who's talking about the topic of Word of Faith or even subtopics of Word of Faith, they get dropped into different categories. And you just kind of have to – you know, you have to know where all the footage is and what everyone says. And there's no way any one person can memorize that. So it has to be in a text. Wow. Format. So it's like trying That's to put amazing. together a 10,000 or multiple 10,000 piece puzzles <laughs> <laughs> to make a new puzzle. It's, it's wow. so hard. And I really found that if you just focus on it helps me to focus on smaller little pieces and over time you start seeing the bigger picture. Sure. If I start to look at everything and get overwhelmed with, well, I gotta, I gotta get the editing done. I have to give right. the music guy notes on what the music should sound like and the animation guy. Like it's just, it can be, it can be very expensive too. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm sorry, that was supposed to be encouraging, but... <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the most encouraging thing you can do is be realistic with people, yeah, though. So I think it's helpful. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, maybe here's some encouragement. I find what you guys do and the people in the podcast world to be very, very helpful. When you guys interview a person, you're giving me a pre-interview for when I interview a person, right? So I can 
anticipate like what their answers are going to be or, Oh, I like what they said there. Maybe I'll have them, you know? So I think podcasting is definitely a great thing. Um, You're welcome. Vlogging. I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. That's really, really cool. That is very encouraging. Thank you. That, that is so neat. I hadn't even thought about that, but I do that whenever I have guests come on too. I'm, I'm like, okay, have they been interviewed by anybody else? Let me make sure I don't like repeat the same questions. All out. <laughs> trying to trying to find a different angle, but that is really cool. I love the the um, behind the scenes, like the really nitty gritty part of things like this, because it's easy for somebody to pick up the American Gospel, watch it. It's fascinating. It's well done. The music is is just really perfect. And to think this is cool, this is easy. I want to do this, but. It's, it's important that we understand that there's like a lot of hard work that goes into things like this, that we can see um, the, the love and the, the patience and just the, the effort that it takes to get something like that out there. So hopefully somebody who's thinking, oh, man, I could totally do that. will will at least take um, some time to pray about it before they decide to do something like that. Cause I, I know just, just the little bit of podcasting is um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the background. And so it took me a couple of months before I figured out how to even, and this is a tiny itty bitty thing compared to the, the massive thing. What type of like memory system do you have to have on your computer for that? Like, is it massive? Yeah. I mean, storage wise, you know, I'm working <laughs> with a 20 terabyte hard oh, drive wow. for footage <laughs> wow that gives you an idea it does oh my goodness boy you don't want that to get lost or broken huh <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then you have to yeah make sure things are backed up right that's yeah so, it's, oh wow that's a lot that is a lot of space okay that's exactly the kind of thing i was hoping to hear about like those little random things from the from the background but it's still fascinating to me that you did some of that on your own you see like Ray Comfort's background stuff whenever he does the behind the scenes and he's got like 50 people in one room and they're all doing different things. And so boy, bless your heart. We need to be praying for Brandon. What you just heard was that Brandon needs prayer because that's a lot. So (laughs) um, if it's okay with you, you, are you comfortable transitioning to the um, questions that some of my listeners sent in? Sure. Great. Cool. Okay. And thank you so much for all the time that you've already given us. we'll, we'll, We'll zip through these really quickly and then I'll let you go. But, um, so, so some of these, if you can't answer, it's totally okay. But the first question came from Karen, and she wants to know your position on cessationism. Um, I do consider myself a cessationist. Um, I I think, you know, it's one of those things that you can't really point to a specific passage that just says <laughs> the gifts have ceased, but it kind of takes... Um, again, like a detailed explanation of, um, you know, the apostles, apostolic gifts, what the purpose of them were and how you see like a pattern of them kind of declining as time goes on in scripture. So it's kind of like deduced. It's just not very explicit. So I don't really like to, (laughs) to argue about that point because i think you know most what would would the word be uh sound continuationists could agree that one not every gift like not every gift is available to every believer right and i think that's an error in care in a lot of these nar or extreme charismatic circles where they think because we can be like Jesus, every gift, miracles, tongues must be available to us. And that isn't true. The spirit sovereignly gives the gifts to whoever he chooses. And scripture says, you know, we are a body. And if we were all an eye, we wouldn't have need for each other if we all had the same gift. (laughs) So I think that's the important part. There are abuses to the gifts that I think need to be addressed. But um, yeah, and I think I want to touch on that, explain it in a general way in the third film, what the differences are, but then like, how can we agree? Right. So, yeah. 
That makes a lot of sense. I think there's a language gap too there that I've I've encountered a lot where if I'm talking to a continuationist and they are um, they tend to think that a cessationist would say that there's no there's no more gifts of the spirit and their immediate response is always well, what about patience or you know then I'm like but see that's that's there's a problem here where we're misunderstanding one another so hopefully that'll be helpful too if you um, get that in there and and it addresses these issues uh, the actual question that she has on here. I didn't, I didn't know there was a difference, but she said, um, as in normative cessationism versus concentric or absolute cessationism. I didn't know there were three different categories of that. Did you, is that no, a thing? I, uh, I don't think I've studied it to that. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one there. Wow. Karen, you went over my head there, listener. I need you to, um, educate your, maybe your someday class. I'll get there. I know it just hasn't been like a pressing thing that I thought I need to look into. I didn't know even that there was differences. So I'll definitely have to look into that. Um, Emily was wondering if um, there's going to be a American gospel conference and if you could give any potential dates, if there was going to be, I believe she's hoping it'll happen after she has a baby so that she can (laughs) travel. Um, I've had some, discussions i won't say any names uh actually i was i've been asked about this by other pastors because i think they've seen the influence um the particular pastor has was in the film and because he gets emails about it all the time thought it would be a good idea so there has been talk about that but as of now, we don't know because of the current situation, you know, right. with the coronavirus. So. Sure. Okay. Interesting. So that's just for a future, uh, future question there. We'll figure that out later on down the road. That's kind of cool though, just to know that there's even talks because I hadn't heard about that until she sent me that question. That's yeah, really, really I've, exciting. I've mostly been resistant to it because it's kind of, I don't know, a little, I I don't want to I don't want to be in a spotlight at all and that's <laughs> when we've talked about this uh you know it it sounds bad to me that oh a film that I made is now the topic of a conference right and yeah. I don't <laughs> I I just don't <laughs> feel like that should happen but people have been trying to convince me <laughs> <laughs> so just more like, emails more emails yeah. to him when 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 I talk about this, I really say what I presented in the film is not something that I've thought up. This is stuff that I've seen faithful pastors talk about over you know decades throughout. You could say throughout church history, sure. and I'm just trying to take all what I see and present it in a format that I think is more compelling. Yeah. And so the American gospel is not just my idea. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is what people have been talking about for a while. So definitely yeah. there's a need for that type of conference, but I don't know if it deserves <laughs> to be connected to my film. <laughs> Oh, you're, yeah, very humble right there. I think this would be a really cool conference. But I understand like that from the background right now, I'm I'm helping with an online conference. So it's not even like happening in like person. And I'm just helping with some of the technological stuff in the background. And there's so much more that goes on in a conference that has to be put together than I realized. So it's also just like a lot of work for yeah. something like as soon as you get done with it, then you've only got a few months before you'll be planning the next one. <laughs> so <laughs> for the next year. So there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into conferences. And, and so I can understand why that would be, that's a serious thing that you have to like really take some time to think about whether or not you want to do that. Not to mention, of course, the idea of putting your name on something like that would be kind of nerve wracking. Um, so the last listener question that I have here, there was a few others, but I, I've kept you for a really, really long time. Um, Cindy w- wants to know, 
when the third one is coming out and what it's about, but we already talked about that. So Cindy's question got answered throughout the whole thing. So oh, sorry, Cindy, your question's already been answered, but I want to thank my listeners for sending in such great questions. If I didn't get to your question this time, I'm so sorry. Maybe we'll be able to get to it next time. Hopefully I'll be able to get Brandon to come back on. I do have one simple, silly question for you. It's something I like to do at the end of all of my interviews, just to give people a little bit insight of your personality and who you are aside from all of this. So my question to you, Brandon, is if you if you needed to travel anywhere in the world to record somebody for a documentary, where would your number one destination for recording want to be? Um, I think I'd like to go back to Hawaii. Um, <laughs> I was there uh, nine years ago on my honeymoon. So that's been a place that I've, it's just a beautiful place. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone I know... <laughs> lives lives there but uh yeah i mean that i'm sure there are i i know there are a lot of beautiful places to see um especially outside of the united states um new zealand is another one i have uh i have uh grandparents that live in tasmania which is the little island south of australia yeah i've never been there (gasps) never been to the down under so that's kind of that would be cool a place another place that i've wanted to go but if it wasn't such an insanely long flight i would love to get to do stuff like that all right that's it that's all the questions i had for you brother thank you so much for joining me we're gonna be praying for you for your for your next documentary and for all of this hopefully the pandemic will wind down and you'll be able to travel and definitely we will be continuing in prayer for you god bless you brother thank you thank you for everything that you do it's such a blessing to the whole the church um as a as a community thank you for the prayers and the encouragement absolutely Good to be right. here. thank you brother you have a great rest of your day we'll talk you to too. you a little later all right Bye. Bye. Okay, Humblebees, that's it. That's all I have for you today. I hope that that was a blessing for you. I'm so thankful for Brandon and for all of the work that he does with the gospel, with the American gospel, all of the different things that he is working on behind the scenes. It's obviously a lot more work than I thought it was whenever I first got to talk to him. So hopefully you'll join me in praying for him and hopefully you're having a very blessed day. So that's it. We'll talk to y'all a little later. Bye, Humblebees. Thanks for listening, Humble Bees. This is Tulips and Honey. Over and out. I think that diamond still needs a little more polish. Yeah. <laughs>good how are you i'm good i can hear you i can't see you yet oh okay. is it is it still uh, loading here we go there it goes oh it worked awesome okay. i gotta just edit this out their children thought it would be really fun to like run back and forth and just smack them in the head like repeatedly <laughs> and i'm like Guys, patty cake is a thing, okay? If your children really want to smack you, (laughs) patty cake is a great option. No, that's not how it works. Okay.